As we uh, continue on in this series in Romans, uh, if you're new to Venture, I encourage you, we are in a series where we've been going through the book of Romans pretty slowly, but hitting different sections of it and walking through it. And this week we're in chapter 10. So if you got a Bible, turn to Romans chapter 10. If you didn't bring one, the blue one in the room right in front of you, page 1,123, or pull it up on your phone. If you're watching online, we're thrilled to have you guys with us. So thankful that you can be a part of the Venture family this morning and that you can worship with us. Hearing from so many different people, some who are worshiping in this context, some who join us online. No matter how, we're always thrilled that you're a part of it. And today I think it's gonna be particularly helpful to you. In fact, if you see the title of the message is how to be beautiful, how to be beautiful. And, And I know when I say that, I almost entitled it Beauty Tips from Tim. Because when you look at me, I know you think that is a man who knows what it means to be beautiful. (laughs) We don't have to laugh that hard at it. Um, I always remember, you remember that commercial that used to come on, I think it was Civil Shepherd and others is hair product and, and the woman would look at the screen and she'd say, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. And I always think, okay, I'll just hate you because you're a narcissist. So, you know, uh, out of it. Now, when we talk about how to be beautiful, and in fact, it's kind of strange, it's how to have beautiful feet. And as I say that, I, I, I'm just going to go on record, I don't think anyone has beautiful feet. You may think you do, just keep it to yourself. And yet, if you look at our passage today, and in the passage, there's this verse, and, and Paul's actually quoting a verse from the Old Testament. It's kind of a strange verse. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And I told you he's quoting a passage. Paul's writing this in the first century. He's actually quoting it's from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote it about 700 years earlier. And he wrote it to people that were in captivity. It was when the nation of Israel had been taken into captivity. They're prisoners, they're not, they're not at their own home. And Isaiah makes this prophecy. He said, a messenger is going to come and stand on the mountain and declare, you guys get to go home. You don't have to be captives anymore. You don't have to be prisoners anymore. And and, and it's this image that, that someone, a messenger like that, who's bringing the kind of good news that people want to hear. Man, that's beautiful. Their life is beautiful that their mission is beautiful. And so Paul takes this prophecy that was about the children of Israel, and then he's gonna bring it to his day and to our day as well, and says there's something beautiful about people who bring good news. I, I don't know about you, but does it feel like today there's more bad news than ever? and we have more sources to get bad news. And we do it to ourselves. Sometimes I think about it, I'm like, why do I get on social media just to have a stream of people who are angry about something or this has gone wrong or that, and I find myself getting worried about it. I, I, on my, I follow Twitter. I reached a point with Twitter, I realized this thing's upsetting me. And then every so often I'd get somebody and they post like a funny video or it's a puppy or something, you know? And I found myself just like getting rid of all the ones that made me upset and just putting like the puppy videos and that, you know, it's like, oh, somebody's got something encouraging and that. And and I realized psychologically part of what's going on is it's just nice to see something that's up, that's good, that's happy, that's not angry all the time or upset all the time. 
And, and I think it's part of this principle of when someone brings good news, that that marks their life. There's something beautiful about that. And I think if anybody should be these kind of beautiful people, shouldn't it be the church and shouldn't it be Christians? And so today we're gonna to look at a beauty regimen. How could I be beautiful? How could I live this kind of life? How could this mark my kind of life? Especially when you think of the good news we've actually been given. And this beauty regimen actually starts with internal beliefs first and then we'll move to action. And so it's, there's some things internally that have to be true about us in order for us to live this way. And I've kind of framed it in some questions of whether we really believe some things are true. And we'll, we'll see it from this passage and it dips back a little bit into last week. So here's the first question. Do I really believe that Jesus is the exclusive way of salvation? Do I really believe that? Do I, do I believe Jesus is not only the way, the exclusive way? And last week we looked at this passage. It's one of my favorite passages in all the Bible because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Paul's talking about this parallel track of what does it mean to trust Jesus? And it's a parallel, it's not one after the other, they both part of it is that I believe in my heart, he actually died on the cross for me. He rose from the dead for me. And I'm forgiven through that. And, and I confess with my mouth, in other words, I make it the declaration of my life, he's my Lord, I'm gonna follow him. And, and Paul says, anyone who does that is saved. In fact, many of you made that decision last week for the first time. We had many people in both services that, that based on this verse, you said, yes, that is my confession, that's my belief. And you took that step. Now, we confess that, of course, Jesus is a way, but here's where it gets hard. And here's the word we really don't like, but it really goes to this core belief. Do I believe he's the exclusive way? He's the only way. Because Jesus believed that, by the way. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Unless there's any mistaking it, he, he then finishes out, no one comes to the Father. No one has a relationship with God. No one makes it to heaven or God's kingdom except through me. You go, ooh, that gets pretty exclusive quick, doesn't it? Now, you may be here today and you go, I, I frankly don't believe that. I, I believe there are many ways to God. And, and that is depending on your worldview or your belief system. Let, let me just say though, if you believe there are many ways to God, Christianity can't be one of those ways because it can't be true. Now, why do I say that? Because Jesus makes such a strong exclusive claim that if he's not the only way, he's either wrong or he's lying or he's deluded. And Christianity's built on the fact that he's actually God, that he's sinless, that he's perfect and that he accomplished everything that he said. So, so if fundamentally you're saying there's something that Jesus said that's not true, then the whole system of Christianity falls apart. Now, again, you, you may not agree. You may still say there are many ways. I would just say to you, Christianity can't be one of those ways then. Because you've said by definition, it's not true. Now, for many of us, we not only believe that Jesus is a way, we believe he is the way. And then you follow it up with the next thing that we see in this. Do I really believe that God's offer is universal for all people? So the way is exclusive, but the invitation is inclusive of every person on the planet. Look back in Romans again, Romans 10, 12, and 13. We saw this last week. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is the Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it's a powerful combination, guys, when you think about it, that Jesus is the only way, but is the way that's offered to everybody on the planet. And Paul says it doesn't matter what nationality you are. If you read through the New Testament, it doesn't matter your socioeconomics. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter if you're male or if you're female. None of that matters. God invites everyone. No one's excluded from the offer that Jesus alone gives. 
And, and, and so these first two beliefs that we have here, and, and if you're here today and you go, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Christ, I would just ask you really to make sure that you would say in your heart, yeah, I do believe Jesus is the only way. And, and I do believe that this offer is for all people. Now, some of you at this point are saying, Tim, what does this have to do with beautiful feet? We'll get there because here's the third part of it. Do I really believe that people must hear the good news in order to be saved? If you said yes to the first two questions, oh yeah, Jesus is the way and it's open to all people. Now, now Paul's gonna narrow it down a little bit more. Do I really believe Jesus is, and, and people need to hear this message? Look what he says in this next verse. He says, how then, he's talking about all these people all over the planet, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So how are they ever gonna call out for Jesus if they haven't believed in Jesus? How are they gonna believe in him in whom they've never heard? How would they ever believe if they've not heard of him? How are they to hear without someone preaching? That word preaching doesn't mean that you just have to be a preacher on the stage. It's talking about verbal telling. And somebody verbally told them this good news. How are they to preach unless they're sent as it is written, and here's our, our line, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So, so Paul's following this chain straight down the line. And, and he says, you've got people out there, that, the invitations for all people, but how are they ever gonna call on him unless they believe in him? And how are they ever gonna believe in him unless they've heard of him? And how are they gonna hear of them unless somebody's telling them. And how are they gonna tell unless they've been sent? And he says, oh, and, and the people that are sent, the people that take that message, the people that bring this to the world, oh man, God goes, they're beautiful. Man, these are beautiful people who their life mission, their life work, their life purpose is around bringing this good news to others. Now, what you hear in this, and there's a pretty strong claim though, that people in order to come to Christ, they have to hear a verbal message. They don't just come to it through nature. You know, we looked at it in Romans one, there's enough in creation to point people to God. There's enough out there, there's enough in the general revelation that everybody on the planet should be able to go, okay, there's a designer, there is a God. We have our own conscience that guides us to those things. But Paul's making a point here that unless they have this special revelation, unless someone has brought them this message, you don't come to Christ. You, you don't experience this salvation. And I know some of you go, well, what about people that maybe they did respond out there? What about people that, that they looked up and they realized there is a God and they do respond? Uh, here's what I believe and you see it and I think in scripture, people that have made that response, God, remember we've spent a whole week in chapter nine who's sovereign by the way in control of all things, he sends someone with that message. You see it in Acts chapter 10, you got a guy named Cornelius. And Cornelius, it, it described him, he's a devout guy, he's a, he, he, he was really respected God but he didn't have salvation like this. And, and God sent an angel to Peter and said, hey, Peter, you, you need to go and tell Cornelius this message. See, Cornelius responded to the truth he did have. And then God sent a messenger who brought this verbal message of who Christ is so that he could experience it. In fact, Don Richardson is a missionary and he's kind of tracked different groups around the world. There's different groups, different tribes, different people. There's missionaries who've come into to groups, tribes that are remote and a church is already built and a cross was there. And they said, who came and brought the message? And they said, no one. We started having dreams. We, we realized there was a God and, and this image of the cross kept coming. And, and in preparation, they had built this and then God sent the missionary with the message of that. And, and so when you reach that point, because maybe you're here and you go, well, yeah, what about the people that are out there? Here's what I know to be true. Anyone who responds to the truth that God's given them, he will send them more truth. But no one, and this is where this point is important, no one comes to that ultimate saving faith apart from knowing about Christ. Now, here, here's the third part of this, or fourth question in it. Do I really believe as a follower of Christ, I've been sent to share this message? This is where it gets personal. I mean, up until this point, you may have been, yes, yes, yes. 
But now we, we, we come to each one of us and I one of those sent ones. Is my life supposed to be beautiful in this way? Do I, do I bring this message like I'm supposed to? And I'll be honest as I read through this, part of this really convicting to me. Of going, am I making this a life purpose around that? And unless you think, well, you know, Paul's just talking to people like you, Tim. Eh, Jesus, he looked at his disciples before he left. This is right before he goes up. So it's probably pretty important, isn't it? Last thing he says to his church is, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So here's your, here's your marching orders. Go therefore and make disciples. Go, go therefore, and just spread out on the whole planet and make disciples. It, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So baptism is that physical picture of what's happened spiritually in their life. So they're gonna have to come to Jesus. They're gonna have to hear this message in order to become a disciple. And then you keep teaching them all that I commanded you. Don't worry, you're not doing it alone. Behold, I'm with you, even to the end of the age. Acts 1.8 is in parallel with it. He looks at them and he goes, you will be my witnesses. He, he, he looks at humans, by the way, and he says, you're it. You're plan A. And I don't have a plan B. And, and, and it's interesting to me, if you read through the Bible, you'll never see an instance of an angel sharing the gospel message. They share other messages from God. They share other warnings. They do other responsibilities, but God has uniquely given the responsibility and the privilege to human beings to be the messengers of this message of salvation. We're plan A guys, and there is no plan B. And, and as you look at this, I, I love how Paul puts it because Paul so embraced this. He says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He uses this word ambassador. You know, we lived overseas for a couple of years. We lived in Bangkok for a couple of years. And, and if you go when, you know, in any foreign country, especially if you're in a capital city, the embassies that are all lined up there and the ambassadors and the ambassador's household. And, and as an American in Bangkok, I knew that if you made it through the gates at the U.S. embassy, that little plot of ground was actually considered U.S. soil. That little plot of ground where the U.S. embassy was, I mean, it governed under the laws of the U.S. with it. And the highest representative in the country was the ambassador who was there to represent the country, the values, the laws, everything about it. And Paul looks at each one of us and he says, yeah, I, I know you're on foreign turf. I know you, that you're in this world, but you're there as an ambassador. And, and every little plot of ground that we're claiming and we're, we're claiming for Christ's sake, it's part of God's kingdom. It's how, how we represent the kingdom. And so we show the, the values of the kingdom. We show what people are like in the kingdom. We show how we treat each other in the kingdom. That's why it's so important. And I'll just say this as a church, man, when people come to church, when people come to venture, this should be the closest experience. We've claimed this ground for God. We're with believers. It, 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 we're claiming it for heaven. So we should live out kingdom values. Church should be the place you experience it the most. Unfortunately, a lot of people would say church and maybe in your church background, you experienced it the least and the hurt with it. That's why it's so important when you come to church here, and, and let me just state this kind of a side note. When you come, if you're part of the Venture Church family, it's so important, not just what happens on this stage, it's even more important what happens sitting out there and in those hallways and in the parking lot and how you talk to each other and how you love each other and how you model that, man, we're part of a different kingdom here to the point that people would feel it. But, but let me come back to that core responsibility. And, and this is the, probably the most convicting question for me. Do I really believe I've been sent with this message? To a point that I, I think about the people I'm interacting with. I'm thinking about the good news that I uniquely have in that. Do I, do I believe it's one of those, and, and this is probably where we divide it. Do I believe it's one of those core things I'm called to do? Or is it one of those kind of extra things God wants us to do? And if you ever do it, it's really good but it's kind of an extra. I mean, I think about it with my, my kids at home. My boys are home right now. They have some core responsibilities we call them to do. I mean, you're supposed to keep your room 
somewhat clean uh, with it. Clean the bathroom, take out the garbage, do your homework. I mean, these are kind of core things. Now, there's extra things. Like if I came home and they told me, hey, dad, I took the car to the car wash. I'd be like, wow, that is so nice. If they blew me away and said, dad, I cleaned out the garage. I would be like, oh, that's awesome. But, but I don't have that expectation on them. Or look, apply it to my own life with my job here. Let's say you came this morning and the worship team did an awesome job and JC's up there and everything goes and the video goes for the Roman study and then the stage goes silent and nobody walks up. And everybody's like, where's Tim? You guys call me and, and I'm at home and I'm like, I was really sleepy today. I, I just needed a week. And they're like, did, did you line up, you know, one of the other guys, maybe Charles or, or Chuck or one of the, I, that would have been a great idea. Probably should have done that. If on a consistent basis, I'm not showing up and I'm not doing this, I can promise you what will happen. Uh, the elders are going to sit down with me and kind of go, hey, Tim, this, this is a fundamental part of what you were called here to do. This isn't like the extra thing that it'd be nice if you did every so often. Now, again, I don't wanna make it a one-to-one -one parallel because I don't wanna turn our, our walk with God into just a job with that. But I do think we've lost perspective of some of those fundamental responsibilities some of the fundamental things that I think God would look at us and, and, and has expectation of, man, I, I placed you guys here because you share, because you're plan A. And if in our minds, we always treat it as, you know, that extra special thing like cleaning out the garage, that if I did it sometime, I'm sure God would be thrilled with me. The reality is we won't do it. Now, am I worried to death that God's not going to accomplish his plan? No, go back and read Romans 9. That's a great part with it. Paul starts with the sovereignty of God. He says, hey guys, God's going to do this thing. God's in control of this thing. But the great part of Romans chapter 10 is we get to be a part of it. We get to, to bring that good news. We get to live the kind of life that when God looks at it, he goes, man, that's a beautiful life. And I think a fundamental part of a beautiful life is that I'm the kind of person that I do believe that Jesus is the only way. And I believe that he has invited everybody on the planet. And I believe they actually have to hear about it in order to make that decision. And I believe that I've actually been sent by God. I have a purpose here. And a key part of that purpose is how am I modeling and sharing the good news that he's given me. And, and I know when, when we say that, there's a part of it you can go, yeah, but I, people are uncomfortable with it. I don't know what they'll think about me. You know, it's interesting. I, I saw an interview. There's a video that was posted. I don't know if it's up anymore. You know, the magicians, the comedians, Penn and Teller. Have you ever seen them? The two magicians, one of them talks, one of them silent the whole time. They have an act in Vegas for years and years. And the guy who talks is a guy named Penn Gillette. And he's a known atheist. Um, I mean, he, he does programs with it, debunking Christianity, different parts. He's, he's a pretty strong, known atheist. And, and a few years ago, a Christian gentleman came to him and said, hey, I want to give you this Bible and I want to tell you about Jesus. And, and Penn Gillette put a video up post that experience. And most of his fans expected him to blast the guy. It's like, that's exactly what I don't believe. And he didn't believe what the guy said. Listen to what he said though. Listen, listen as he talks about, this is an atheist talking. He said, he said, I've always said, you know, I actually don't respect people who do not share. I don't respect that at all. I mean, if you believe there's a heaven and hell and you believe people could be going to hell and getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, I mean, if you really believe that and it's not worth telling them, because it would be socially awkward to tell him. An atheist who think that people shouldn't be sharing, just leave me alone and keep your religion to yourself. 
he said, how much do you have to hate somebody not to share that news with them? He said, in my mind, I mean, how much do you have to dislike somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and you wouldn't tell them about it? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming to hit you and you didn't believe it and the truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And if you believe this, isn't this message more important than that? That's pretty fascinating coming from an atheist. But, but he, he's actually calling us on the things that we just went through. Do we really believe that? Do we believe it? Do we believe? Do you really believe it or not? And if you do, do you believe that you've been sent with it? That it's a fundamental part. And when I say you, me as well. Because you, you know what? It's much easier to share this on the stage. It's much harder out in the community. And especially in the Bay Area. And especially in some of the context, and some of the neighbors, some of the friends, some of your work context, even as you think, how do I bring that good news there? Guys, hear me. I'm not telling that you walk out of here and you're doing drive-by evangelism. You know, everybody you see, hey, you're going to hell and let me die. That does no good and it actually will turn people off here. But the flip side of it is where I have so buried my faith I've so buried it that no one would ever know. I would never share. Paul says people don't come to Jesus unless they hear. Final just belief thing I would ask is, do I really believe that God's love and his patience are beyond compare? Do I really believe that God doesn't give up on people? God is patient with people. Look how Paul ends this section in Romans. He's talking about, remember this whole section is about the Jewish people who have not come to Christ yet. And by the way, this is the group that persecuted Paul the most. And yet he said, man, my heart breaks for him. Look at this. He says, then Isaiah is so bold to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I've shown myself to those who did not ask for me. He said, Isaiah said that people who've been far from God are actually gonna find him. People that weren't even asking for it are gonna find him because the good news came to him. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I've held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. He says, even my own people right now, they're not receiving it, but notice God's posture toward them and God's posture toward the world. Man, I hold out my hands to them. I still give them an opportunity. I still care. I still love them. I still share with them, even when they're turning from me. Even when they've turned, it's the craziness. And you see it out there. And some of you, you look at all the different beliefs and you go, man, it is getting crazy out there. God sees all that. You know what his response to it is? Hey, I'll still forgive you. I I love how Peter put it when when there were some mockers in the church and they said, where's your God? Why hasn't he come back yet? You said he was coming back one day. Look how Peter puts it. He says, the Lord isn't being slow about his promise. He's gonna come back one day, as some people think. He's being patient for your sake because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everybody to repent. I mean, guys, the only reason Jesus hasn't come back and claimed the whole planet now, the only reason we haven't experienced everything that he promised is God is patient toward people who don't know him. And in this season of patience, he looks at you and me and he says, hey, you're my messenger. You're you're the people that are supposed to bring the beauty of this gospel, the beauty of this message to the whole world. And no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you are from God, no matter what background you've had, no matter what you've done in any way, it's never too late for Jesus who still holds his hand out to you. You know, I I love the story that Kimberly Shoemate tells. She's a young woman who came to Christ. And at the time she was a witch, fully avowed. She's fully into new age. And she had, I mean, she would describe it. She had tarot cards. She had a crystal ball. She had all the books on it. She would cast spells and hex with it. And one day, despite all of her intentions, she found herself in a church. She couldn't believe it. Even as she walked in, she's like, uh, one of these things is not like the other. 
And the pastor came out and said, hey, why don't you turn and welcome somebody next to you like we do? And she turned and by God's grace, because Kimberly's standing there and her hair's black and white in all different ways and she's wearing spiked belts. And she turns and there's Lisa and her hair's dyed and it looked different. And she's like, okay, we can connect with each other. And they started their journey, their spiritual journey together. As Kimberly describes it, every week she'd come down mad. She's mad at the pastor. She said for about three weeks, she'd come down with question after question. And then after three weeks, he kindly handed her to the associate pastor. <laughs> she said, I started going through every elder. And in and, and her words, she said, it just made me mad. Their good news. Their good news of their way, the only way. How dare they? And, until one night she found herself going to a life group. And it's a great setting, by the way. I, I would encourage you, you know, we've been talking about life groups. If you're exploring on your journey, one of the best places to go, go be in a life group. Go give an opportunity. Those groups welcome people who are on the journey. And in that life group, listen to how she describes it, because she's there and, and the guy that led the life group that day, Scott, was so patient with her. And she was watching how everybody interacted with each other and they had this kind of peace and they cared for each other. And she's like, I need these kind of relationships in my life. And, and then as she sat there, she said, after the study, Lisa sat beside me as Scott, the leader, patiently listened to my new age argument. But one by one, the scriptures I'd carefully prepared to punch holes in, in it, the gospel came back to me with hurricane force. Scott's words, but especially the Bible's words, confounded my cosmic view. After we sat there for an hour debating, I was exhausted. My hardened heart and my argumentative nature had finally had enough. As Lisa drove me home, my mind ached as I replayed Scott's words. All the Old Testament and the New Testament verses had one oddly familiar voice, one tone, one heart. I wondered, how could a book that is written by so many different people over the course of hundreds of years fit together perfectly as if one amazing storyteller had written the whole thing? The Holy Spirit began melting my vanity, my arrogance, with a power stronger than any hex or incantation or spell I'd ever used. Suddenly the blindfold I'd worn for almost 30 years was stripped away and instantly I knew what I was searching for, Jesus. The same God I'd neglected, whose name I'd used as profanity, whom I'd flat out rejected, was the one who'd sent his son to suffer for me, to take the guilty verdict so I could be found innocent. My eyes filled with tears as I exchanged the darkness with which I'd grown so accustomed for the light of God's truth. It was such a profound personal moment between me and the Lord that even Lisa sitting in the car next to me had no idea what was going on. And that, that happens in the journey. That happens in this room all the time. That as you're here and you come to that, maybe in your days you're hearing that and you go, yeah, that is the truth. I need that truth. And it's with you and the Lord. She went to her house and she said, I got to clean out. So she threw away her tarot cards and she threw away all her witchcraft books and she started cleaning out. And the last symbol of that old life was her prized crystal ball. And so she and Lisa went down to the Malibu Pier at the Pacific Ocean. And there was a part of her who was a little scared, but she threw it in. And as she threw it in, she said, as I dropped the ball into the deep blue water, I knew my future was secure. I had a savior who'd always be with me. Still moves me to tears to think he waited all those years of, through the anger, the disappointment, the fear, and the bad choices. But all the mistakes I ever made were wiped clean. Guys, let, let me ask you again. Do I really believe that God's love and his patience are beyond compare? or beyond what anyone else does. No one is too far from God. No one has done too much for God. God hasn't given up on you. And by the way, he hasn't given up on the people around you. Maybe people that you've written off that you go, there's no way they'd ever come to God. I can promise you somewhere in Kimberly's journey, somebody in that church looked at her and said, that young woman will never get there. But little did they know 
the love and the power of God to change any life. So how do we move from beautiful beliefs to beautiful action? Let me just give you some action steps on this. First one is pray, pray. Hey, sharing the good news and prayer, they go hand in hand. And so if you're not praying about it, you won't do it. That's why all the time, if you read through Paul's letters, look how many times he asked people to pray for him. He says, will you pray that I have boldness? Would you pray that I would share? Would you pray that, that I'd be willing to do it in this context? And I look at it and I go, man, if Paul needed that, how much do we need it? Pray. And so as you pray, I, I'd encourage you to do this. Pray for the world. Adventure, we have regions of the world where we sent missionaries out. Maybe find out about one of those regions. Maybe find out one of those missionaries. Maybe get your heart connected to it and just start praying for the people there. Pray for my sphere. And here's what I mean with that. You have about seven to 10 people in your life that you uniquely interact with. It can be people in your household. It could be neighbors. It could be a coworker. It could be that person that's always at the coffee shop when you're there and you've gotten to know a little bit. Person that does your hair. There's about seven to 10 people in your sphere, your world that you're interacting with on a regular basis. What would happen if you started praying for them? Pray for them by name, pray for an opportunity, pray that God would just open a crack, just a crack to have a conversation. You, you don't have to go zero to a hundred. How about just zero to one? That God gives you the opportunity to let them know you're a Christian. Pray for my heart. And this is what I have to do all the time. Because if I don't pray that God puts this on my heart, it just kind of disappears. It becomes that extra good thing I probably should do. But it doesn't beat in the same way that God's heart beats for the world. And so pray for your heart. Second thing, prepare. So if we're actually sent, if we're actually ambassadors, I can promise you this, before any ambassador leaves this country and goes to another country, we prepare them for their responsibilities. Do we take this responsibility with the same magnitude? Prepare, be able to tell your story. Now, here's the one undeniable thing. People can argue, because as soon as you start talking about sharing the good news, here's what people say all the time. What if they ask a question I can't answer? What if they, I mean, ask parts of the Bible I don't know about? They probably will. It's okay. Remember, God's sovereign. He's in control. Guys, God's the one that saves them. We don't. Isn't that great to relieve us of that? Amen. I've never saved anyone. God saves them. He's in control with it. He saves them. I just share. I just do my part. And, and here's the part no one can argue against. Your story. What God did in your life. And maybe they got this argument, that argument, but you can look them in the eye and go, you know, can I just tell you, here's what Jesus did for me. Can I tell you what life used to be like? Can I tell you how God shows up in my life? Can I tell you what it means? Can I tell you, man, I had this awesome verse. Man, this verse spoke in my life. You'd be surprised how many people who are far from God, if you just share from a verse that really spoke to you, they're, they're like, oh man, that's cool. Tell me more about that. Sometimes you give the opportunity, they're going through a hard time. You just ask them, hey, would, would you be offended if I prayed for you? you? Some people might say yes. Just taking one step in that, be able to tell your story. Now, here's the other part. Be able to present the good news using the Bible. If I stopped the message right now and had you turn to the person next to you and say, hey, I want you to use the Bible to share the good news about Jesus. Could you do it? Now, I'm not going to do it. Some of you are panicked right now. You're like, uh. <laughs> because our minds start going like, where do I go? What do I do? Let me give you, uh, just write these passages down. We've been going through the book of Romans. You can just stay in the book of Romans. You don't have to go to any other book. Just start them with Romans 3, 23. Everyone is sin. We all fall, fall short of God's glorious standards. Talk to them. Go, hey, we're all sinners. Because sinners, anybody who didn't reach God's standard. Second one. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were sinners. So we're sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8, write that one down. Romans 3, 23, Romans 5, 8. Then follow it with Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're sinners, Christ died for us. The result of sin is gonna be eternal death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So how do I experience that? Romans 10, 9 and 10, we just went through this passage. Believe in your heart and confess in your mouth. 
Now, some of you would do well, write down these passages, go in your Bible with a highlighter and just highlight those verses. Then if you have the opportunity to share that and somebody says, hey, can you show me? It's not just your words. Hey, let me show you what the Bible says about it. Just taking a few minutes of preparation. Final thing that you're gonna need to do, you gotta present it. And so we wanna present it by demonstrating how you live, you serve and give. If we're gonna tell people that Jesus changes your life, shouldn't we show them that our lives are actually changed? Probably a pretty fundamental part. Doesn't mean that we have to be perfect but we're on the journey with him. And then here's the other reality. At some point, you actually have to declare it with your words. You gotta be willing to tell him, to speak it. And here's what I'd ask you to do. Would you make it a goal with me? I'd love it for those of us that go, you know what? I really do believe I've been sent by God. Would you make it a goal that sometime over the course of this school year, God would give you the opportunity to share the good news with one person, just one. And and maybe you start praying for a list of people. Maybe you start looking for opportunities and openings. Maybe you start with just real gentle spiritual conversations with it. Because here's what I know, and I've had the opportunity as a pastor, there's some things I love as a pastor. I love when we have children that are dedicated. I love when we have baptisms. I I love when we go out on days and we go serve our community with it. But beyond just what I do as a pastor, some of the greatest moments of my life are when I'm with someone and you get to tell them about Jesus and God does his thing where he opens their eyes, where they respond and they believe it's good news for them too. I'm telling you, it's, it's one of the most profound things that we get to be a part of. And the reality is God doesn't need us to do it, but he chose us to. So I, I would just ask you, would you this year just start praying, go, God, you know what? I wanna share with one person. And they may or may not respond but I want to be a person who's not just bringing a good news. I want to be a person who's bringing the good news that only comes through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we get to be those who bring this good news, that that you call our lives beautiful when we do. Lord, I thank you that that you opened my eyes. I, I wouldn't have done this apart from you, but you showed me. Lord, I thank you that all across this room, there are stories like Kimberly. There are people listening online that were so far from you and yet you brought them to yourself. And so I just pray, would we be the kind of people that take this to the world? Would we be the kind of people that we share what is so beautiful in our lives that only Jesus Christ has done? And we pray this in his name, amen. Thank you.